Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Fulton Financial Third Quarter 2021 Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following management's prepared remarks, we will host a question-answer session, and our instructions will be given at that time. If during your conference call today you do require operator assistance, please press star than zero, and an operator will be happy to assist you. As a reminder, this conference call may be recorded. It is now my pleasure to hand the conference over to Mr. Matt Joswak, Director of Investor Relations. You may proceed. Good morning, and thanks for joining us for Fulton Financial's conference call and webcast to discuss our earnings for the third quarter of 2021. Your host for today's conference call is Phil Wanger, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. Joining Phil are Kurt Myers, President and Chief Operating Officer, and Mark McCollum, Chief Financial Officer. Our comments today will refer to the financial information and related slide presentation included with our earnings announcements, which we released yesterday afternoon. These documents can be found on our website at FULT.com by clicking on Investor Relations and then on News. The slides can also be found in the presentations page under our Investor Relations website. On this call, representatives of Fulton may make forward-looking statements with respect to Fulton's financial condition, results of operations, and business. These statements are not guaranteed guarantees of future performance and are subject to risks uncertainties, and other factors in actual results could differ materially. Please refer to the safe harbor statement on forward-looking statements in our earnings release and on slide two of today's presentation for additional information regarding these risks, uncertainties, and other factors. Fulton undertakes no obligation other than as required by law to update or revise any forward-looking statements. In discussing Fulton's performance, representatives of Fulton may refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures. Please refer to the supplemental financial information included with Fulton's earnings announcement released yesterday in slides 10 and 11 of today's presentation for a reconciliation of those non-GAAP financial measures to the most comparable GAAP measures. Now I'd like to turn the call over to your host, Phil Winger. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Good morning, everyone. I'll begin with some overall thoughts on the quarter, and then Kurt Myers will discuss our business performance, and Mark McCollum will share the details of our financial performance. And after that, we'll answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> Fulton's performance was again solid in the third quarter of 2021. Our earnings per share of $0.45 cents was another quarterly record for us, surpassing our previous record of $0.43 cents per share in the first quarter of 2021. We saw growth in many segments of our business, as Kurt and Mark will discuss, and asset quality remains stable. The economy and the markets we serve continue to show improvement. Unemployment is in decline, and the communities we serve continue to move forward. And as vaccination levels increase, we remain optimistic about our company's future and the future of the markets we serve. As I noted last quarter, we have seen several mergers and acquisitions in and around our footprint, and that trend has continued in the third quarter. Fulton has taken a look at select opportunities that might be a good fit for us, and we remain interested in supporting our future growth through M&A. We're we're particularly interested in those companies, which would be a good fit for Fulton's strategy and our community-oriented style of banking. As always, we remain focused on our shareholders and will remain disciplined on pricing if the right opportunity presents itself. During the quarter, we, we were able to take advantage of a dip in our stock price and have utilized approximately one third of our 75 million share repurchase authorization. We will continue to repurchase stock under that authorization if it makes financial sense to do so. Throughout the past year, I've referenced the challenges brought about by COVID-19. Now, as vaccination rates continue to rise throughout the markets we serve, Fulton is moving forward with our previously announced plans to to begin bringing more of our team members back to on-site work beginning the week of November 1st. We are really proud of how our team members have adapted to constantly changing circumstances 
and we are pleased to have provided an essential service that our customers could depend on throughout the pandemic. As we reunite our team, we remain focused on, our, on achieving our three main priorities of growing the company, achieving operational excellence, and sustaining effective risk, risk management and compliance. Now I'll turn things over to Kurt to discuss our business performance. Well, thank you, Bill, and good morning, everyone. Uh, as Bill noted, our third quarter performance produced solid results and I'd like to share some detail on several key areas. Strong loan growth from residential mortgage lending, moderate loan growth from consumer loans, and growth in certain commercial lending areas led to approximately $205 million in total loan growth, or about 4.5% annualized when excluding the impact of PPP forgiveness. Starting with consumer lending, loan balances grew $186 million, or 3.5% linked quarter, and 14% on an annualized basis. This growth was driven primarily by strong residential mortgage and residential construction lending, with other consumer loan categories also contributing to the growth this quarter. Overall, mortgage banking business remains strong as we continue to experience origination activity above pre-pandemic levels and see opportunities to either sell our conforming mortgages in the secondary market at healthy spreads or increase our balance sheet at beneficial yields. As noted in prior quarters, our asset-sensitive balance sheet provides room to continue to grow this segment of high-quality, in-market, residential mortgage loans, and we continue to evaluate our opportunities to do so. Residential mortgage originations for the quarter were $659 million, a decrease of 25% from the prior quarter, but purchase activity accounted for approximately 70% of the total residential mortgage originations during the quarter, up from 60% in the second quarter. At September 30, the mortgage pipeline remains at approximately two times our pre-pandemic levels. As I noted before, residential construction also had a strong quarter, increasing 21 million or 14% linked quarter. Finally, in consumer banking, a new fintech partnership for student loan refinance business contributed to consumer loan growth this quarter. The overall consumer loan growth was partly offset by continued headwinds in home equity lending line utilization. Turning to commercial loans, we saw pockets of growth driven by increased line utilization, strong commercial construction lending, and growth in our core CNI business. However, we saw continued pressure in our floor plan business as dealers continued to struggle to get inventory. This kept total commercial loans flat for the quarter. During the quarter, commercial line utilization increased 46 million, the first increase we've seen since the beginning of 2020. This is an encouraging sign of business growth and activity. Commercial construction loans grew as well, up 2.1% linked quarter or 8.4% annualized. CNI loans were down 7 million. However, excluding floor plans, CNI loans were up 0.5% linked quarter and 2% annualized. Commercial mortgages were flat for the quarter. The commercial pipeline has been relatively consistent over the past few quarters and ended the quarter flat on a linked quarter, year to date and year over year basis. Turning to deposits, growth for the quarter continued as we saw expected seasonal inflow of municipal balances. Total uh, deposit balances increased $350 million, or 1.6% linked quarter, with seasonal municipal deposits representing $290 million of that growth. Also during the quarter, we continued to actively manage our deposit costs lower. Moving to fee income businesses, we were pleased with a strong quarter as fee income increased $11 million. Strong results in wealth management and mortgage banking and solid performance in consumer fee businesses drove this increase. Our wealth management business continues to perform very well, driven by strong equity markets, solid sales efforts, and good client retention. Assets under management and administration grew to $14 billion in the third quarter, up from $13.7 billion at the end of the second quarter, and $11.8 billion at the end of the year-ago period. These trends drove quarterly wealth management income to record levels for the fourth quarter in a row. 
Mortgage banking delivered another strong quarter on solid loan sales and wider gain on sale margins. Even when excluding a positive change in the mortgage servicing rights valuation, which Mark will discuss, fee income was up on a linked quarter basis. Continuing with consumer uh, banking, consumer transactional fees were up 8.7% linked quarter as customer activity continues to grow. This increase was across the board in the majority of the consumer products. Overall, commercial banking fees were down modestly for the quarter. We saw a sizable increase in capital markets and recorded modest growth in merchant banking and card fee income. Offsetting these categories was a slight decline in cash management and a sizable link quarter decline in SBA gain on sale fees. Capital markets activity, which is primarily commercial loan interest rate swaps, increased in the third quarter. We expect capital markets revenue to return to more historic trends over time. However, this will continue to depend on customer preferences, commercial loan demand, and interest rate expectations. SBA gain on sale fees declined link quarter, coming off a very strong second quarter. In summary, we remain encouraged by the increased activity within our commercial business during the period. Moving to credit, asset quality remains stable, delinquency remains low, and deferrals and forbearance continue to decline. Non-performing loans declined 3.5 million linked quarter and remain relatively stable since prior to the beginning of the pandemic. During the quarter, we booked a net recovery of 2.3 million or five basis points. This compares to 6.9 million or 15 basis points of annualized net charge-offs in the second quarter. Historically, we have included a detailed slide on COVID loan deferrals. However, you will notice we have removed that from the presentation as COVID deferrals and forbearance continue to decline, ending the quarter at only $65 million. Overall, our credit outlook remains cautiously optimistic for the remainder of 2020. And as a result, we have further reduced our 2021 provision for credit loss outlook. Now I'll turn the call over to Mark to discuss our financial results in a little more detail. Thank you, Kurt, and good morning to everyone on the call. Uh, unless I note otherwise, the quarterly comparisons I will discuss are with the second quarter of 2021. Starting on slide three, earnings per diluted share this quarter were 45 cents, on net income available to common shareholders of $73 million. This represents an increase of $0.07 cents per share versus the prior quarter. Our strong third quarter performance included increases in net interest income and non-interest income, as well as a negative provision for the quarter, offset by higher operating expenses, which I'll cover in more detail later in my comments. Moving to slide four, our net interest income was $171 million a $9 million increase linked quarter. This was due to a pickup in fees earned on PPP loans forgiven during the third quarter versus the second quarter, moderate loan growth, and higher yields on earning assets during the quarter, coupled with a relatively sizable decline in interest expense. First, I'll provide some more detail around our PPP program. At the end of the second quarter, we had $1.1 billion of outstanding PPP loans and $36 billion of unearned fees. During the third quarter, our PPP loan forgiveness was $526 million, and fees earned were $18 million, up from $12 million earned in the second quarter. Since the start of the program, the SBA has forgiven approximately 78% of our PPP loans, and as September 30th, we have $590 million of PPP loans still on our books, with approximately 18 million of PPP loan fees yet to be recognized. Turning to the investment portfolio, balances grew modestly during the period, increasing $80 million to end the quarter at $4 billion. We did see an increase in deposits with other institutions by about $450 million during the quarter, but we would expect this to decline a bit in the fourth quarter if deposit patterns are consistent with prior years. Turning to deposits, total deposits grew by approximately $350 million on an ending balance basis. And as Kurt noted, we lowered our cost of deposits for the quarter from 15 basis points to 12 basis points and would expect this to migrate modestly lower in future periods. The third quarter traditionally represents the peak inflow 
of our municipal deposit balances, and we would expect to see those balances begin to outflow in the fourth quarter and into next year. Non-municipal deposits increased approximately $60 million during the quarter, whereas municipal deposits represented $290 million of our overall quarterly increase. Our average loan-to-deposit ratio declined from 86.9% in the second quarter to 83.2% in the third quarter from a combination of increased deposits as well as a significant decline in PPP loans. Our net interest margin for the third quarter was 2.82% versus 2.73% in the second quarter. The nine basis points of link quarter expansion resulted from higher PPP loan fee recognition, as well as higher earning asset yields and a continued decline in deposit costs. Turning to credit on slide five, our third quarter provision for credit losses was a negative 600,000 compared to a negative 3.5 million last quarter and a negative 5.5 million in the first quarter. Year to date, due to solid performance, including a net recovery in the third quarter and an improving view on asset quality, it has been appropriate to release reserves throughout 2021. Slide five shows our quarterly credit quality metrics. We recorded a net recovery of previously charged off loans at 2.3 million for the quarter, and non-performing loans to total clones declined, uh, whether including or excluding PPP loans. The allowance for credit losses, excluding PPP loans, remained flat on a link quarter basis, down 15 basis points since the end of last year, and currently stands at 1.45%. As always, our allowance for credit loss trends could change in future periods based on new loan origination volumes, loan mix, net charge-off activity, and longer-term economic projections. Moving to slide six, uh, non-interest income, I will touch on just a few items that Kurt did not cover in a little bit more detail. Uh, mortgage banking revenues were driven by strong mortgage loan sales and widening gain on sale spreads, which were 194 basis points this quarter versus 185 basis points last quarter. During the third quarter, consistent with this year, we have chose to portfolio saleable mortgage product and have now put approximately $288 million of saleable mortgages onto our balance sheet thus far this year. Keeping more mortgage production on our balance sheet has impacted mortgage banking revenues modestly for 2021, but may provide a significant long-term benefit to net interest income versus, versus the purchase of lower-yielding investment securities. Lastly, during the quarter, we recorded a valuation uh, to the valuation allowance of our mortgage servicing rights asset of $3.5 million uh, due primarily to the higher interest rate environment. Our MSR asset was $32.9 million on balance sheet at September 30th. This balance is net of a $3.1 million mortgage servicing rights valuation allowance, which remains as of quarter end. Lastly, in fee income, other fee income increased by $2.6 million link quarter. This was primarily due to gains of $2.1 million on equity investments, as we have seen an investment in a fintech fund generate very strong returns recently. Moving to slide seven, non-interest expenses uh, were approximately $145 million in, in the third quarter, up $4 million link quarter. Uh, this increase was driven by the following factors. Uh, the day count uh, in the third quarter accounted for about $1.6 million of the increase, and we saw increased benefits costs of $1.6 million for the quarter that were due to increased health care costs. As a reminder, we are self-funded for our health care, and we saw employees hitting their deductible limits. We would expect these costs to revert to historic trends in the fourth quarter and then decline in early 2022 as deductibles reset. Um, we also saw higher variable comp costs due to both higher pre-tax earnings as well as higher commissions in our wealth management area. And lastly, on expenses, we saw higher data processing costs uh, occurred during the quarter due to various technology initiatives uh, across the company. These increases, some of which are not expected to recur, were offset in part 
by sales of real estate related to our branch closings earlier in the year, and also one sale leaseback transaction, which when combined reduced other expenses by approximately $1.4 million. Turning to taxes, our effective tax rate was 16% for the quarter, consistent with the second quarter. Slide 8 gives you more detail on our capital ratios. As of, as of September 30th, we maintain strong cushions over the regulatory minimums, uh, and our bank and parent company liquidity remain very strong. During the quarter, we repurchased approximately 1.7 million shares at an average price of $15.43 and have utilized approximately one-third of our $75 million share repurchase authorization. On slide 9, we provide our updated guidance for 2021. We expect our net interest income uh, to be in the range of $655 to $665 million. We now expect our provision for credit losses to be negative for the year. We expect our non-interest income, excluding securities gains, to be in the range of 230 to 235 million. And we expect operating expenses, excluding charges related to our balance sheet restructuring, to be in the range of 570 to 575 million dollars for the year. Included in this number are some planned expenses in the fourth quarter related to COVID vaccine bonuses, as well as a contribution to our Fulton Forward Foundation. Lastly, we are aware that many of you look at pre-provision net revenue, or PPNR, as a key metric to assess the profitability of key operations. We also know that many of you calculate this metric differently. We have included our version of this metric in the financial tables of our press release. We would also like to point out a couple of additional items to consider as you assess our PPNR results. First, PPP fees earned have increased $6 million from the second quarter to the third quarter. And also, MSR valuation allowance adjustments resulted in a $5.7 million swing uh, from a $2.2 million increase to the allowance in the second quarter to a $3.5 million decrease in that valuation allowance in the third quarter. When you remove the impact of these items, we believe our PPNR has shown continued improvement each quarter in 2021. As a result of our first quarter balance sheet restructuring, earning asset growth, core margin stabilization, and continued cost containment efforts. And with that, we'll now turn the call over to our operator for questions. Brian? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you would like to ask a question over the phone, please press star and then one on your telephone keypad. Again, at this time, if you would like to ask a question over the phone, that is star and then one. Our first question will come from the line of Frank Schiraldi with Piper Sandler. Your line is now open. Good morning. Hey, Frank. Um, hey, Frank. Just, uh, Kurt, you mentioned the pipeline, commercial pipeline has been pretty stable, and I uh, wondered if you could... Um, uh, follow up a little bit on your comments about the dealer floor plan utilization. Um, you know, the mechanics there in terms of it sounds like it was um, uh, slower again or, or reduced again in the third quarter. I'm just wondering your thoughts about 4Q and, and going forward and, and just if you could quantify uh, the size of that uh, and, and where utilization rates are right now. Yeah, sure, Frank. Uh, so just a, a little more color on uh, – uh, just just uh, loan, loan growth overall. Uh, originations um, were pretty consistent uh, quarter to quarter. Uh, pipeline remained steady as well. So uh, I think uh, we, we feel that um, originations will remain steady in, in as we look forward into the to the fourth quarter. Uh, we do see increased business activity uh, overall. I think the uh, the overall commercial line utilization. Um, uh, growth was was a really encouraging uh, factor. Um, so as we look forward, there we expect originations to uh, continue to accelerate, uh, and this and the stable uh, pipeline we, we we think is positive at this point. Specifically on uh, dealer, um, that headwind for the quarter, length quarter was twenty four million dollars, uh, and essentially, uh, it, you know, we're we're maintaining that business and even growing that business, but uh, car dealers just can't get cars. 
Uh, almost all of our dealers, all their new cars are pre-sold, uh, so they're they're in and and off the um, the line uh, very very quickly. That business overall for us is about three hundred fifty million dollars. Okay, great. Thank you for all the color. And then um, just lastly, on the uh, you also mentioned um, the fintech partnership on the consumer side. I think you said student loans, and so I would think that that refi business is actually pretty slow right now. And, and um, just wondering, you know, your thoughts on, on uh, growth or, 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 you know, really what this partnership could provide in terms of growth. And, um, and is this something you're looking at, um, you know, across the board on the consumer side that um, these FinTech partnerships that, that could be, um, you know, a tailwind? Yeah, Frank, so we are looking at FinTech partnerships on the origination side. Uh, we, we had not been in uh, the, the uh, student loan business, uh, and it was a good way to, uh, to, to get into that business. Uh, we have specific uh, originations that, that will uh, accept uh, under that program, and it, it is very modest at this point. It's, it's uh, ranging 2 to $4 million of originations per month. Uh, but we think we'll we'll continue to grow, uh, and we are looking at uh, uh, other partnerships that can accelerate uh, our overall origination activity on the consumer side. Okay, great, thanks. And if I could just sneak in one more in terms of the uh, mark on the expenses, uh, you've talked about the investment in digital um, as being sort of a partial offset to, to cost saves you've gotten elsewhere. You talked about that running maybe um, you know data and and software running maybe one to two million higher uh, in terms of expense year over year. It seems like that, um, you know, is, is holding true and, and already in run rate. I'm just wondering, is that still a pretty good bogey to think about in the 4Q? And, and you know, is that still something that you ramp up uh, through 2022 as well? Yeah, um, um, I think uh, I think what you've seen on the, on the data processing line is is consistent uh, with the guidance that we gave at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, I would expect to see that you know probably continue to creep higher. I mean, just when you think about the continued digitization of our industry, um, you know, as well as the way you know the accounting changed on that, Frank, where you know previously you could buy a piece of software and amortize it over seven years, but with so much more going to the cloud. Um, you know, and things being subscription-based, um, you know, I think that's also going to, you know, see that line to go up uh, a little bit higher uh, discreetly. Uh, you know, I guess while we're talking on expenses, the one comment, you know, I guess I'll also make on just our overall expense uh, base, if you look at our expenses year to date, um, and if you take out the debt extinguishment costs, um, you know, that takes our expenses year to date uh, to $431 million. Uh, and that's up from a little under 425 million over the same period a year ago. Now that's about six and a half million, or about a one and a half percent increase year over year. But when you then look at the reasons, you know, for that, um, the principal reason really just comes down to the fact that we're making more money this year. Um, if you take between, um, you know, management-related incentive bonuses as well as specific commissions within our wealth area, uh, which is produced through nine months. $10 million of year-over-year -year, uh, additional revenue. Um, you know, those, those uh, incentive accruals and wealth commissions account for $7.6 million. Um, you know, so more than 100% of our year-over-year -year increase. So, you know, when you strip that out, uh, and the fact that we're making a little bit more pre-tax, uh, you know, we think we have uh, delivered on the, on the cost savings program that we put in place last year. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks for all the color. You bet. Thanks for the questions, Frank. Thank you. And our next question will come from Daniel Tameo with Raymond James. Your line is now open. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, um, Good morning So maybe just starting on, I just want to make sure I heard this comment right. Um, you made a comment about an expected decline in deposits. Was that in the fourth quarter? Was that overall deposits? And, I, you know, you talked about the municipals peaking in the third quarter, but um, did I catch a, a comment on overall deposit decline in the fourth quarter? Yeah, yeah, Danny. So uh, this is Mark. Um, if you if you think about our normal trends in our municipal deposit business, you know, the third quarter is always the, always the high water mark. Um, and if, and if you look back in prior years, we would have between 
you know, five to six hundred million uh, between the peaks and the valleys of that business, with the peak always occurring in the third quarter. Um, you know, I think one of the questions that the whole industry is sort of wondering right now, you know, is that on top of that, then you had these surge deposits during uh, the beginning of COVID, um, and you know, we're the jury is really still out as to how much of that is surge versus how much of that is going to stick around. But uh, typically for us, you know, from uh, you know, the third quarter uh, to the first quarter, so over that six-month period of time, is when you would see that movement from the peak to trough, which, again, has historically been in the five to $600 million range. Okay, great. That's helpful. Thanks for that. Um, and then not to, uh, to be that horse here, but on the expense guidance, um, you know, maybe we could talk just a, about a little bit about what's going to be the – um, you know, the, it sounds like there's a lot of moving parts in the fourth quarter where you provided guidance, but um, how much of the the fourth quarter number is going to be kind of one time in nature uh, on either side, and to, just to try and get us uh, help us get a base um, as we start 2022 modeling. Yeah, yeah, I think Thanks. with uh, some of the items that we uh, uh, that I mentioned there in the script, Danny, I think you know, you know, that could be in the you know in the in the Three to to five million dollar range, depending on on what you know overall um, you know overall pre tax earnings end up being, um, and uh, but I think those then would not recur you know into next year uh, unless we would uh, you know have another year uh, similar to this one in terms of uh, pre tax profitability. Okay, so um, that's related to the three to five. Can, can you just kind of sum up what? I apologize for repeating, but just some of what those would be, and then I'll, I'll uh, drop off. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you were you were fading a little bit on the call there, Danny, but I think you're just asking for a little bit more detail on that three to five. And again, it comes down to the two items I mentioned, which uh, you know is specifically we are um, you know encouraging uh, our employees to uh, receive a vaccine, and we're offering uh, for those employees who are fully vaccinated by November first. Uh, that they would receive a $500 bonus, um, you know, so um, that would be part of, uh, you know, that one-time number. Uh, and then the remainder would be a contribution to our Fulton Forward Foundation, which would make up the remainder uh, of that, that number. Yeah, okay, that's exactly what I was looking for. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. I'm all set. Sure. Thank you. And our next question will come from the line of Chris McGrady with KBW. Your line is now open. <laughs> Hey, good morning. Hey, good morning. Hey, Mark. A question on the uh, just the composition of the balance sheet. Um, how do, how should we think about earning asset uh, growth or remixing from here? Um, is it more likely? I know it's dependent on deposit growth, but is it more likely to shift into more profitable assets or outright grow in the next few quarters? Um, well, again, a lot of that depends on uh, you know supply chain issues in our country, and you know you know how fully uh, you know things open. As, as Kurt referenced in his script, uh, you know we did see uh, some signs of optimism with uh, an increase in commercial line utilization. Um, uh, you know, I, I would also say that when you look at um, within our fee income, um, uh, you may have noticed that our overdrafts uh, were actually up seven hundred thousand, which um, you know, we're still not back to pre-pandemic uh, levels of overdraft fees, but we do think, uh, you know, when you got into the details of that, we saw a 17% increase in the incidence of overdrafts uh, linked quarter, uh, which may, uh, you know, be a sign, and one quarter does not clearly make a trend, uh, but we think that may be a sign, uh, you know, that folks are starting to, you know, burn through some of this surge money and the and this stimulus money, and that that would overall you know, then lead to more, uh, you know, loan activity in future periods. Um, you know, certainly the goal is, I mean, we're, we're sitting, uh, you know, today still about $1.8 billion, uh, you know, higher in excess cash than what we did pre-pandemic. So uh, there is certainly a lot of room, uh, you know, for us to, to make that shift, uh, you know, from overnight cash, um, you know, into, uh, into more profitable asset classes. And, and that's certainly, you know, our expectation. Uh, you know, exactly what percent, you know, of that and what percent of loan growth, um, you know, we'll be, we'll be speaking to that certainly on our fourth quarter earnings call when we set our guidance uh, for uh, 2022. 
Great. Thank you for that color. The um, Just a clarification on the dealer floor plan. I think you said it was around 350. What what, what was the peak in that portfolio? Um, I don't have the balances, the historical balances, but it's off about $100 million. Um, it was like seventy million uh, linked quarter in the in the sec, uh, first to second quarter, and then it was another twenty four million. So it's eighty to one hundred million off of what we would expect um, okay. utilization to be at, at this point. Okay, and then maybe if I could on the uh, M and A comments, Phil, in your prepared remarks, we can just refresh this the size. I know it sounds like in market uh, cultural fits, but um, I think in the past you said minimum of a billion, but but just kind of an update on uh, potential range of what you might consider. Thanks. Yeah, I think we're, we're still looking at uh, a billion to uh, eight or nine billion. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question will come from the line of Russell Gunther with DA Davidson. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. I just, uh, you know, a bit of a piggyback to Chris's question and following up on the loan growth conversation. So, you know, appreciate the color on the commercial pipeline originations, you know, pockets of growth you haven't seen in prior quarters. Just a detailed some headwinds. So, as we tie all of this together, you know, is that four, four and a half percent annualized XPPP the right way to think about Fulton near term, or are there, you know, additional tailwinds or optimism that, that we're not seeing that you guys are expecting over the next couple quarters? Um, yeah, Russell, it's Kurt. Um, you know, we we are um, expecting. Um, uh, that range, you know, four to six percent. Uh, if you look at historically, the organic growth has been been in that range. Um, uh, we are doing some things like the the fintech partnership and some other things to accelerate uh, origination. So, you know, we want to be kind of at the top end of that range, all things being equal, where 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 they are right now. Uh, certainly, a pickup in in business activity. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll drive that growth without adding new customers. You know, we look at, you know, growing the business by adding new customers. Uh, we think there's a significant uh, tailwind uh, at some point uh, when we just get back to normal business activity in our commercial book. Um, you know, the, the commercial uh, construction utilization uh, we referenced as well, um, that just shows that, that – those construction mortgages are being done, they're funded, they're moving forward. I think that's a positive sign as well. I think it really just depends on how quickly that happens. Okay. No, very helpful. I appreciate it, Kurt. And then uh, just on the securities portfolio, so you mentioned the growth this quarter as well as some of the deposit inflow dynamics this quarter and over the next couple. Uh, but how should we think about that near term in terms of overall growth and investment appetite? Yeah, um, you know, we, you know, think of our investment portfolio primarily, you know, for liquidity. Um, and, um, you know, while it's grown a little bit this year, you know, that's really been, been you know, largely commensurate with just, you know, overall uh, balance sheet growth. Um, you know, there was uh, some opportunity here, obviously, late in the quarter, you know, when rates went up a little bit to, you know, to maybe put a little bit more into the investment portfolio. But for a good chunk of the quarter, you know, the longer end was down. Um, and, uh, you know, it just didn't seem as attractive to us. I mean, you know, ideally for us, uh, we, you know, as I said earlier, we would like to see a lot of that excess liquidity uh, be put into higher yielding asset classes uh, and classes that are, you know, uh, supporting our customers. Um, and uh, um, so I, I would not expect on a percentage basis for you to see our investment portfolio uh, increase, you know, more than what it has historically. Um, but to the extent that, you know, the overall balance sheet grows, then then you, you could expect to see the investment portfolio to grow commensurately. Okay, great. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, everyone, for taking my questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Russell. thanks, Russell. Thank you. And just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, that is star and then one on your telephone keypad. Our next question will come for line of Matthew Breezy with Stephen Zink. Your line is now open. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, First question for me, just on, uh, you know, what is your current outlook for PPP balances and forgiveness from here? When do you think it's totally off the balance sheet? 
And along those same lines, you know, how do you expect the cadence of recognizing the 18 million remaining fees? Yeah. Uh, so of that, of the 18 million in fees and the 590 million of balances that remain, um, you know, our assumption is we're going to be there's going to be somewhere you know around 10 to 15 percent of that might remain on the books, um, you know, and actually go out to become a term loan. But the majority of it we expect to be forgiven. Uh, and we expect that majority bit to be forgiven by the end of the first quarter of next year. Um, you know, so of that 18 million in fees, um, you know, while um, you know there's been a little bit of fits and starts with the uh, you know SBA, uh, I think in generally, Matt, we would expect you know two thirds or around 12 million of that to be recognized in the fourth quarter, and then one third or you know around six million, give or take, uh, to be recognized in the first quarter of next year. Got it. Okay, perfect. Um, Phil, you mentioned, you know, due to in-market M&A and disruption that, you know, there were opportunities on the hiring front. Could you just give us uh, some more color on the extent of those opportunities? Are you talking, um, you know, lenders in, in terms of individuals or teams? And, you know, just wanted to get a sense for, um, you know, what kind of needle-moving opportunity that could be. Yeah, so, um, I, I mean, <laughs> We're looking for uh, teams and lenders all the time. Uh, I think when there are acquisitions, the opportunity can become uh, greater. But we're looking for those folks everywhere uh, throughout our footprint. Okay. Um, two more for me. The first one is just, um, you know, I, I noticed that, Common shares outstanding. We're down quarter over quarter. I didn't see a mention uh, that you repurchased stock in the release. I just wanted to get a sense for whether or not you actually did repurchase stock this quarter, what price. Um, I know you mentioned there was uh, some remaining authorization, but did you actually buy back stock this quarter? Yeah. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Uh, uh, yeah, we did. It, it, it was in our prepared remarks. Um, uh, we repurchased uh, about 1.7 million shares um, at a price of $15.43 on average. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. The last one is just um, on, on M&A. You know, this, this is a recurring topic. Um, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, this year in particular, we've seen a lot of deals and the buyer stocks have not performed great. And as you've looked at, you know, other deals in your markets where, you know, buyer stocks have not performed well, could you just sit, share with us some of the items you think are, are critical to a deal um, being successful and well-received by shareholders versus, versus not? Yeah, I think, um, uh, Matt, this is Mark. Um, you know, first, you know, right now, certainly, uh, you know, tangible book value dilution and earn back, you know, has a heightened focus. Um, I always think it's important to look, you know, at those two together, um, you know, because you could accept, uh, you know, maybe, um, you know, a little bit higher earn back uh, up front if, if you have a really strong company that you're buying. So, you know, then that earn back, uh, that the earn back of that upfront dilution becomes a little bit lower. Um, you know, I'd also say when you look at that in terms of, you know, absolute numbers, you know, I always caution a little bit to say, well, you know, we never do a deal more than 2 or 4%, you know, upfront dilution, because a lot of that depends on the relative size of the, of the entity you're acquiring as well. Um, you know, but in general, uh, you know, I would say that from an earn back perspective, you know, we, we want to be three years or less uh, on that earn back. Um, and then uh, EPS accretion for us, it's always important in the first year of combined operations that you show EPS accretion. Again, how much accretion you show is also going to be a function of the relative size of, uh, of the entities. Um, and then we also, you know, focus on, uh, you know, internal rate of return uh, and make sure that the IRR on the deal, you know, is, uh, you know, higher than the, than the target's cost of capital. Um, and we focus on the target cost of capital because with a smaller entity, there could be more risk uh, embedded there than with a larger, you know, entity with, with a more diversified revenue stream. So we always want to have an IRR uh, in excess of the target's cost of capital as well. Um, and then on top of that, I would tell you that, you know, in non-financial terms, I mean, what's, the, you know, I mean, I just talked about all the financial stuff as a CFO, but, um, you know, the most important thing really is that there's a good cultural fit. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, you know, a great financial deal with a bad uh, culture fit will ultimately end up being a bad deal uh, for shareholders. 
Great. That's all I had. Thank you for taking my questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. And our next question comes from out of Eric Zwick with Boning Scattergood. Your line is now open. Good morning, guys. Good morning, Eric. I appreciate all the, the color commentary already on the, the near-term expense outlook. Maybe thinking a little bit more kind of mid- or longer-term outlook, there, there's obviously been a lot of press about inflationary pressures and, and labor markets. Curious, one, if you guys are seeing any pressure either as you look to recruit um, new lenders or other associates, um, you know, for, from external uh, sources or anything, you know, internal from employees uh, asking for increases. And then, you know, maybe second part of the question, can you just remind me when you typically award merit increases and, and how, you know, inflation uh, is maybe considered in, in those uh, decisions? Sure. Uh, uh, this is Phil. Uh, there is intense uh, pressure on wages at every level of our company. And I, as we talk to our businesses, I think it's uh, at, with every business. Um, the biggest problem everyone has is getting employees. And uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a very tough environment to uh, hire people. And I, I think for all industries, I, we see wages continuing to climb, and we see permanent inflation. That's helpful. And when do you uh, typically kind of award uh, annual April. increases in April? April. Okay. Uh, and then maybe just switching gears a little bit, uh, Mark. I appreciate the um, you know calling out kind of tracking the, the PPNR and then that's been growing year over year. You know, if we think about that from, from a profitability standpoint, you know, relative to, um, you know, average assets or even looking at ROA and ROE, uh, you know, where are there opportunities today within the organization to, to pull levers to, um, you know, gradually increase that, um, you know, outside of considering M&A or a steepened uh, yield curve or improved interest rate environment? Yeah, yeah, the most obvious uh, uh uh, you know, area to focus on is that excess liquidity we're sitting on. Um, you know, right now we've got, you know, $1.8 billion that effectively is earning about 15 basis points. Um, you know, so, so that, you know, when you, when you think about, like, I know there, you know, some of the analysts on this call, I know, you know, strip out our PPP fees, which, which we understand and think is appropriate to get down to core PPNR. Um, but when you strip out the impacts of PPP on our margin and our loan yields, um, you know, we think you also need to then strip out the impact of that excess liquidity, um, you know, because as you get back to, you know, a more normalized environment and a more normalized environment for our company, uh, you know, is a, a long-term loan to deposit ratio between 95 and 100%. Um, you know, so w when you get back to that level, um, you know, that, that, you know, redeploying that excess liquidity kind of gives you back um, about the same amount as what the PPP fees you know, are actually pulling away. So, um, uh, so we think that's that that's by far the uh, um, you know biggest lever and opportunity for our company. Thanks for taking my questions today. You bet. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thank you. And I'm showing no further questions at this time. So now it is my pleasure to hand the conference back over to Phil Wagner, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, for closing comments and remarks. Well, uh, thank you again for joining us today, and we hope you will be able to be with us when we discuss the fourth quarter results in January 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, this concludes our conference call today. Everyone have a wonderful day.